Hello, everybody. So nice to be with you and still scared as usual <laughs> when I need the talk. <laughs> but um, the one thing that came up to me just before we started today was today's gospel. I don't know if you read it or heard it, because Jesus said, turning himself towards people all around him, they say, he said, these are my brother, my sister, my mother. And that's how I feel with you, a spiritual family and community. When we speak about people in jail or kept as slaves, we usually, usually consider that someone, someone keeps others behind, locked behind bars or holds them in control with handcuffs or chains. That's why you had that picture with the lady breaking her chains. Let me tell you that the worst slave driver is our own ego, always telling us what to do, whether we feel like it or not. Students were learning French with me when I was in St. Thomas High School, and well, at the same time as Joe, and those students who learned French, they called me slave driver <laughs> because I wanted them to work as hard as my ego had me working hard since childhood. My poem that I'll read now reflects in the summary, I'll go back over it later, the chains I carried for a long, long time. So, of course, I named that uh, poem, I Want to Break Free, which is the music you heard if you came early enough. I spent a lot of time in my life convinced I was a slave, prisoner of my parents' will as a child and a teenager, carrying chains of poverty as a working married woman, powerless, deprived of love, none to give and so little to get, crawling on the ground of crushing traditions, searching in vain how to break free. Nothing in the outside world held a glimpse of hope. It took me years and years in the second half of my life to pacify my self-centered anger and discover a treasure in my heart, giving birth with gratitude to a loving and wise, wiser lady, slowly approaching a smiling serenity. For well, once I wrote uh, this poem in English before I translated it to French for my own students. <laughs> Usually it's do the other way around. In the previous talk, for those who were here, I spoke about the state of war that filled my mind before my heart found peace. I'll give a little more information today. I was a sick baby during six months as I was subjected to Texas climate, hot and humid. With my American dad and French mother, I changed languages three times until I was five years old and we came to live in France <clears throat> excuse me, for almost 15 years. My parents came from two diff very different cultures and backgrounds. Whenever one was in the other's country, he or she was homesick. As a child and then a teenager, I felt much closer to animals than to human beings. We had cats, chicken, rabbits, even a pig, a pig. And once I felt so sad, I, I felt like going to sleep with the pig instead of going to my in my bed. I never felt I was loved as I wished. Of course, most of us have that feeling ever since we were born. The outside world can't compare with the perfect communion we experienced in the womb. Living in the countryside in a village, I was far away from my schoolmates in the city. I even looked like a little girl when other teenagers were more mature 
with makeup and elegant clothes. The only advantage it gave me was fighting for the best grades in school. Another illusion my ego forced in my mind was that the United States, where my dad came from, was a dream world and that everything would be nicer over there. The crooners' songs with their deep, tender, and warm voices led me to believe I'd find a sweetheart over there with such a voice. <laughs> when I watched movies, when I, while I still was in France, not often, we had no TV, and we didn't go often to town. I thought the landscape would be the same as in Westerns, and that at least I would take advantage of the American way of life. Spoke so much about that. I was 19 when I returned to East Texas. It, it was in February, and it was raining, raining, raining a lot. We began living in an old beer joint that my father tried to turn into a house. There was no running water. I had to walk 500 yards to fetch water in my grandpa's house and carry it back through the soaky ground. I must admit, I was relieved when water came directly to the sink. I attended a junior college nearby at first and needed help to gain more vocabulary. Of course, my father never used slang words, so I didn't understand those. I was happily surprised, though, that the teachers took time to let me complete the tests and exams. Later, I went to the University of Houston and felt a bit lost in that big city. Since my parents' income wasn't sufficient to pay the dorm and the university fees, I also worked in a Mexican restaurant. It was on during the weekends and before university started. Later, I had a little job in the library and another as an assistant to French teachers. Also, even was teaching Latin at 7 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> in the labs. My first wedding was made for the wrong reasons. I didn't wish to make this boyfriend sad, but I was afraid I might become preg pregnant. After I graduated, I taught French in St. Thomas High School. And most of you know that Joe was teaching over there too. There was very little motivation among the boys, except when our French club ate in a French restaurant. Once my husband had a car wreck, my neck was slightly hurt. I missed teaching during one day, and a student told another one, Oh, she's not dead! <laughs> Making my ego feel very, very down. Three years later, my husband and I came in France, and I quickly found work as a secretary, thanks to my knowledge and fluency in English. It was better at that time than now. There was no work for my husband in the area. The company where he tried to get work didn't keep him. We divorced. I met the man who was to become my second husband after our baby was born. I had believed I could not become pregnant by that time. This was a great, great relief. My husband had addiction problems, alcohol, smoking, this led me to look into a spiritual guidance, which I found and pursued until nowadays, 30 years later. I learned how my birth and childhood traumas built my personality and learned also how to love myself and I, in order to be able to love and help others. I learned to sit still for one hour every week and to ask questions. After 25 years of marriage, my husband died from cancer and I was able to take care of him until the end, giving him all the love I could during the three months of his sickness. My inner life brought me peace. The anger and violence I had carried in, inside left my heart and I began transmitting what had helped me change my life. Mainly, 
to people who have retired so they could live this time of their lives with intensity and purpose. Of course, I also translate Joe's sessions and poems and relay them to people who wish to meditate, many of them coming from my yoga students. I've been teaching yoga for 30 years now, too. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> I met my actual husband about 20 years ago, my own peace leading to a smoother relationship than my, with my previous companions. I now practice meditation every day. It's first thing in the morning after walking with my dog. <laughs> I stop running. I take time for myself. I'm convinced that the more I give, the more I receive like today <laughs> with you. My own imperfections, which I learned to see and to admit, are the road to humility. Being happy with them, not judging myself, nor others, it brings me to graces and achievements I didn't believe possible. Of course, my ego previously convinced me that I was never interesting, no, never useful, and I was a real slave of my thirst for tenderness and recognition. When I help other people now, I receive in my heart a reward that no treasure of this world can offer. Can offer. I heard this morning... Uh, a little uh, radio uh, session, and they spoke about Apollonius. I'd never heard about him. Maybe Joe knows about him. He lived during the first century after Christ. And there were many different uh, orientations for uh, spiritual studies. And some people want to follow him like if he was himself a god. And he said, no, no, no. He gave this advice to them. Look for God in your own heart. <laughs> and I think that's what we hear <laughs> every Sunday almost. I'm almost through with the presentation introduction, but what I'd like to um, invite you, if you feel like it, of course, you know, meditations, whatever comes. But during the, your meditation, please have a gentle look on your life. What was happy? what was difficult to go through, never judging yourself, nor your folks, neighbors, or acquaintances. Your parents did all they could, but they were not perfect, neither, either nobody among us is. And try to bring back gratitude and joy from recognizing the beautiful human being you are, each one of you. <laughs> <laughs> 